Now, the last time the feds made the trip down from Atlanta to see the facility, inspectors found a number of violations and downgraded the plant's rating from excellent to good. Last week, St. Lucie's new top man told us things have changed. We're doing all the right things now. We're identifying the problems early. We're getting the right attention on them. And uh, it's just a matter now of uh, continuing day after day to emphasize those standards. And the uh, recognition of those achievements will be forthcoming. But exclusive pictures we've been showing you suggest the problems are fairly widespread. And even Mr. Stahl admits the pictures don't look good. If the plant management is successful, though, the NRC visitors won't see this. The memo says that all dry boric acid, like the crusty stuff on this valve, must be cleaned up. And also, managers are ordered to remove all hoses on drains and vents. The plastic hoses help leaks flow into catch basins for collection and study, or into drains, like these hoses, running into the floor, all of which will be gone by the time the feds arrive tomorrow. And finally, the memo ends with a bit of a pep talk. Quote, now that we know the rules, let the game begin. Mr. Ebnetter, an NRC inspector, makes it his mission to find something, and usually he does. The question is, which one of your guys is going to let him win? Now, the NRC isn't making any predictions about what will happen tomorrow, but they tell us they will not be fooled by a fresh coat of paint. We did this interview last week. The concern for us is whether there is a trend down toward what we call a level three performer or a, uh, an adequate performer. Uh, or whether they're holding, you know, or improving. Tim Malloy, TV12 Eyewitness News. Is it okay if yeah, we have interruption? Sure. Do you want to sit down? Meeting is under Title 50. I'm entitled to talk to you directly at this meeting. You're not allowed to object to public comment. I wish to have five minutes of your time on the record right now, sir, in the interest of public safety. Thomas Saparito wants someone to listen to him. He says he speaks for the public. He used to work for Florida Power and Light at St. Lucie and Turkey Point down in Homestead. But years ago, when he first voiced concerns about safety at the plants, he was fired. He sued FPNL for wrongful termination, and he won. But so far, he hasn't gotten his job back, nor has he seen a penny, because the energy giant continues to appeal. Saparito and other critics of the nuclear industry say the problems that we have been showing you inside St. Lucie are the result of misdirected federal regulation. Now, the agency used to be the Atomic Energy Commission, whose sole mandate was to promote nuclear power. Today, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission must promote and regulate the same industry. A thin line. Delaware Senator Joe Biden doesn't think the NRC walks very well. In a Time Magazine article last March, Biden said, the fox is guarding the hen house. He went on to say the NRC has failed the American public. Biden is now pushing for an independent nuclear safety board. Why independent? Well, right now, five commissioners head up the federal government's nuclear watchdog, the NRC. But the nuclear industry, including FPNL, can veto any potential commissioners. And that is why workers and former workers say they don't feel they're safe going to the federal government with their safety concerns. So the workers are going now to the media. That's our only other source to raise these safety issues and have someone take an objective look at them. The NRC's new chairwoman, Dr. Shirley Jackson, agrees. She told Time Magazine the agency hasn't always been on top of things. The ball got dropped, she said. She promises the ball will not be dropped again. Meantime, at St. Lucie, both the feds and plant management agree FPNL is not doing its job well enough. But Saparito thinks the feds need to get tough to get big power's attention. And this is a good place to make a stand. The NRC is a, is a watchdog that's been tranquilized here. Want to breathe heavy for the camera? Is that what you're doing? If you want to sit next to me. You want to sit next to me? Come over here. OK, come. How about right here in the middle? Is that nice? Okay, you don't need to put your hands on your beautiful face. I want everybody to see that gorgeous face that you have. Were you, what was the emotional journey like? I mean, was it something that... Uh, I think I would say it was like desperation. Initially it started as basic emotional stress, heavy duty stress, and I was working at the time. And that obviously makes a, a bad situation more stressful because you have to juggle 
what you're doing professionally with infertility, which could become, you know, just a complete obsession, which it was for me for about three years. So on top of the financial stress and the work stress and the emotional stuff that was happening, I was like a desperate person. I mean, desperation would really sum up where I was at at that time in my life. How was your husband through all this and all? I mean, since it is... Well, my, uh, my husband always seems to be the more emotion, uh, the, the less emotional and more rational of the two of us. But it took its toll on him as well. I mean, I think it, I let it affect me more. But I have a tendency to do that. You know, as a couple, there's always one person, mm -hmm. you know, that really tries to keep it together. And in our relationship, it's most definitely my husband, who always seems to be able to pull it all together. Mm -hmm. But it was very difficult. I mean, you're making me think of all these feelings that I had, and it's, mm -hmm. it well, was really hard. What, what would you suggest for other couples who may be about to embark, or in the midst of, of all this infertility, um, you know, what kind of things, what kind of... Um, advice could I give? Advice, anything. That I think... I think the only good thing about infertility is normally when it happens to all of us, we're older instead of younger. And most, most of us are in our 30s rather than our 20s, because obviously, you know, infertility, unfortunately, has a way of creeping up on us. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you bring to it a maturity that you don't have in your 20s, so you have the ability to make better decisions or approach crisis better in your 30s than you do in your 20s. But I think you, I think for every couple it's different. And I think what you have to say is you can't say it at the beginning. You have to kind of say it midstream when you're in the middle of the emotional stuff is what I mm -hmm. have a tendency to refer to it as. I think you just have to say, okay, I've had enough. And when you're at that point, that's when you have to move on. You, you really have to move on because you know, it can destroy your marriage, it can destroy your life. Mm -hmm. You can't let it consume you. No. You know, I'm just thinking about how I let that just completely take us over. Mm -hmm. And it drained us and it, it, it took away three years of my life and I'm, I think I'm just emotionally upset about it right now. Because it was just, I mean, for me, I know for a lot of couples, it's, you know, it works. And it's, it's great for those people, but it didn't work for my husband and myself. And, you know, obviously Harrison is a product of, of in vitro not working, which he was, you know, the best thing that happened to us mm -hmm. uh, after such a bad experience. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be on? You'll cut that out, won't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I can't believe I'm getting this emotionally distraught over this. I mean, I can understand. Hi, <laughs> Gail. This is just Trish. Baby. Oh, Sorry. Oh, I do. I can't even. Right. I look at my Nobody cries well on camera. <laughs> except movie stars. Exactly. This is one thing you learn in real life. That the only people that cry well are the movie stars. Uh, you know what? It's just I'm, I'm crying because I'm, I'm thinking back about all of the torture. I mean, for me, it was like torture, and I just, I just didn't stop. Mm -hmm. And besides the fact that we had no money when we were finished, I mean, that really didn't help the situation either. Mm -hmm. So um, I think when I look in the mirror now, I, I see a sadder face than I did five years ago because of everything that I had to go through just to get to the point of saying, OK, it's, it's really time to stop. Mm -hmm. So the advice I, I really have to give everybody is, you know, take the advice of the doctors, but know yourself, because nobody knows yourself better than you and your spouse, partner, husband, whatever. Know your limits, I guess. Right. Know it's hard to know your limits with anything. You know, in any major situation in your life, it's really hard to know what your limits are until you get there. And when you're in an infertility situation, you, you don't know. That's why the first question you asked me, are you prepared? I don't think anybody's prepared for that. Because I think 
deep down in everybody's head, we all think we're put on this earth to do one simple thing, which is, you know, sleep with your partner. And, you know, as a result, you should be able to become pregnant as a result of that union. Right. You know, so when that's not a successful thing for you, you go, well, God, this is so simple for so many people. Why, why can't I get pregnant? And that's a really unfortunate thing that women have to deal with. It's really not a, it's really not fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's society that makes it that way, or we have a bad habit of choosing to surround ourselves with the wrong people. <sighs> but you really have to uh, know yourself mm -hmm. and know when it's time to say it's enough. I've had enough. I can't deal with this anymore. I need some help. I need somebody to talk to and move on to the next thing. I mean, adoption for us was, was most definitely the best part of, of everything. You know, putting the infertility behind us and moving on and going through the adoption process, which we happen to have had a terrific situation. Mm -hmm. And we had a wonderful experience. Now I'm sure that there are people out there that might not have had the same type of experience that Stuart and I had, but we were very, very fortunate in that respect. But then it, but it got, that's after how many years of all the... Well, you know, three years seems like an eternity when you've spent all of that money and you have nothing at the end. And that's a chance you have to take when you go through in vitro. I mean, infertility can end in a lot of ways. You know, sometimes you have to end it. And it's not always with a pregnancy or a biological child. You know, in our case, we've kind of run every gamut there is. You know, we went through the infertility that was uh, unsuccessful for us in terms of all the medical treatments they had available at the time. And then when we put that aside and we moved forward, we went on to adoption, which was highly recommended by everybody around us, including the physicians that were treating me at the time. And it ended up being the best advice that I ever received. And uh, after that, obviously, I got pregnant three months later when Harrison was three months old and Jordan was born as a result. And we still can't figure out how that happened, but it did happen. And, um, you know, we loved him too. Now you have your family. Yes, have we you, certainly have a family. Never thought that you no, we never thought we would even have two children. It was not something we even considered. We just thought, you know, getting to the point of having Harrison, here he comes now, was amazing. You know, we were just very satisfied and very happy with uh, having Harrison as part of our family. And then this little tiger came along. Hey, Jordan, come here. Jordan, come sit with Mommy and Harrison. And now he just wants to model that beautiful blanket. Here he is. He's going to come up and sit with us, too. Please, am I? So now I, 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 you never forget, yeah. but you definitely heal. That's for sure. I mean, every time I look at my house, I think, oh, my God, all of that money that we spent and the move and the emotional stress. And I look at them and I say, yes, I'm a much richer person now than I was before I spent all that money. <laughs> but it took me a long time to get there. <laughs> Are you bored with that statement or what? I mean, she just said that. <laughs> what, what did you do? Okay, well, that was about as interesting to you as in that subject, and you can't blame him. Yeah. He would be a little prejudiced in that respect. Mm -hmm. But Jordan here chewing his blanket, he might have something else to say.